Welcome back to Kansas Med-Aid with Diane. Allied Health Career Training, Unit 21, um, Anti-Infective Agents. So, if somebody's using anti-infective agent or antibiotics, they have an infection, right? So, how does that happen? Well, it's an overgrowth of microbes. In your body, you have a whole body have a universe and there's predators and prey there's good bad ugly all kinds of stuff going on in there bacteria not all bacteria is bad not all viruses are bad you need a plethora of it for um, digestion for the health of your gut what happens is things get off off kilter things happen Taking antibiotics actually is one of the main reasons we get other infections. A super infection, an overgrowth of a different kind. If you take out, most of our antibiotics that we have nowadays are broad spectrum. It's like, it's like a shotgun. If you ever looked at a shotgun shell at the inside, there's a whole bunch of little pellets in there. And when it's shot, they spray out like this. That's like a broad spectrum antibiotic. Then there's microbe-specific antibiotics, and that's just like one bullet gets one microbe. Not very common. Why? You can't really make any money with that, you know, if you're a poor drug company. Um, rather, a broad spectrum, we're not sure what's causing that infection, but I'm thinking it's gram-positive, so you take this medication, it should kill all of it. Well, the problem is it's also killing other bacteria that are useful that you need and so killing both the bad and the good leaves other opportunistic ones that'll rise up and take over which is what you see in C. diff. Yeah. So overgrowth of microorganisms, suppressed immune system and where how do we get suppressed immune system? Well, because perhaps you're, you've been very tired, you have other disease processes going on. Um, some of the meds, how about steroids? Doesn't that suppress your immune system? Yes, a lot of things. Now, in order for a overgrowth to happen, um, we also talked about using antibiotics. That in itself is going to put you at higher risk for other infections crazy, huh? So in order for there to be an infection, you need a food source, a suppressed immune system, and if it's aerobic, then oxygen, moisture, warm, a pH that's slightly alkaline, and a dark environment. Warm, moist, dark environment grows. Okay. Now some bacteria are anaerobic. They don't need oxygen to thrive. Microorganisms, those are your bacteria, your viruses, they can be fungi, protozoas, all of these things. Now, not all are bad. Do you remember the ones that are called bad? Pathogen. A pathogen are considered the bad ones. So, throwback from CNA, the ways of transmission and so forth. I'm not going to go over that. You need to review it on your own, do that. Okay. Make sure you understand that in the elderly and those with a compromised immune system, they're not going to have a lot of the same signs and symptoms of infection because they have a suppressed immune system. They're not going to run a fever. In order to run a fever, you have to be somewhat healthy. Otherwise, your body's not going to have the ability to run a fever. Fevers are not really bad. Fevers are a good sign that your body's working because your body is raising its temperature up to kill that pathogen. It's your body at work doing what it's supposed to do. Too much of the time, the minute we have a slight fever, I have been guilty of this, especially with the children. You know what I'm saying? You need to go to work, your kid needs to go to school, Yes, you give the Tylenol, the ibuprofen, something like that, because you know they're just teething or whatever it is. And so get that fever down so the daycare will take them, right? I remember those days. But actually what you're doing is 
if taking down a fever reduces the body's ability to raise up, raise the temperature up, because most, most of these pathogens have the same ability to be alive as our own body temperature and that same range. So if the body heats up, it's going to kill a lot of those. That's a natural thing and that's an okay thing. But if you have a really poor immune system or if you're elderly, your body's going to even have trouble doing that. So keep that in mind. You're not always going to see this, oh, well, his, his temperature is only 100 or 99.9. .9. That can be significant in an elderly person. And that's something to be aware of. On the bottom of 145, you will see signs and symptoms of localized infection and then signs and symptoms of general infection. I think you'll need to know those because I think that'll be a test question later on. All right, the next thing I want to bring up is on page 146 when we're talking about topical anti-infectives or your topical um, uh, antibiotics. Everybody's heard of triple antibiotic ointment or Bacterban or Neosporin, things like that. We used to put it on every whip stitch. You know, if somebody gets a cut, you put it on. That's actually not a very good idea. I, I've even heard where people are like, I put it in my nose before I fly. Because what you're doing is, everybody's heard of antibacterial um, and anti-infective resistance. That's what you're doing. You're causing resistance. It's kind of an arms race. You know, here was this bacterium and ta-da, we have penicillin, we've conquered it all. And then the bacteria learns its life will find a way, Jurassic Park, I love that one. Life will find a way and it figures out a way to become resistant to that. And then we get a different antibiotic and then that bacteria finds a way around that. And here we just keep going, right? Where does it end? Well, we're about there. Some people now have infections that we have nothing to cure. I'm not saying not to take an antibiotic when it's absolutely necessary, but this business of taking them every whip stitch really isn't good. Nothing's free. Everything has a side effect. Everything has a cost, right? Right, it, it's, it's true. Um, so moving on. Uh, then we have our systemic antibiotics. Those are the ones you would take orally or injected or infused. Always have to watch out for hypersensitivity or an allergic reaction. When someone has an allergic reaction to an antibiotic, even if it's just a rash, they should never take it again. It's very important to ask they say, oh, I have an allergy to that, tell me about that. Because maybe it was just, it kind of upset my stomach. That can be significant and should be reported, but it may not be an allergy. But if they've had a rash or significant side effects, they should not take that um, antibiotic again. It'll get worse and could even lead to um, anaphylactic shock, which is extraordinarily dangerous. Okay. So, as we move on, on page, the bottom of page 146, page 147, 148, you'll see various different um, groups of antibiotics, families of them, such as your uh, penicillin, cephalosporins, by the way, they're cousins, and so if you're allergic to penicillin, you have a 50% chance to be um, allergic to a cephalosporin, especially your first generation ones. Um, sulfonamides, fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones, this is your Cipro, Leviquin, um, Floxin. Those have a very significant side effect. Um, they can cause rhabdomyalgia and um, rupture of the Achilles tendon. There's a lot of things that go on with those. So it's, it's so important to keep your eye out for those. Bactrim is a very common uh, sulfonamide. A lot of people are allergic to sulfa drugs. And even though Bactrim doesn't have the word sulfa in it, it is a sulfonamide and you need to be aware of that. Um, tetracyclines, oh, there's so many different kinds. Aminoglycosides, which by the way, remember anything that affects your kidneys affects your hearing. 
and these drugs can affect the kidney so if they start having tinnitus then they may be going toxic on aminoglycoside. Um, the takeaway here, you do not have to know every category or any of the specific drugs. I think Bactrim's on there, um, but other than that, guys, the point of it is if you read these, most of them you can't take with food or can't take with milk, or if you take this with a protein, it's only half effective. If you take this with that, the point is antibiotics do not play well with others. You need to be aware of that. Antibiotics, generally speaking, if you read through this, should be kept separate from other drugs. And for the most part, you need to know whether it's one you should or should not take with food. Just because it upsets the stomach doesn't mean it should be taken with food. Some of them can not be taken with a protein, but it's okay to take it with a carbohydrate or can't take it with milk. You need to look that up. You need to be aware and responsible for the drugs you give. <clears throat> there are also antiviral drugs and antifungal drugs. Remember, if somebody has a virus, taking an antibacterial is not going to help. And if they have a fungus, same thing, they need to take an antifungal. And if they have a, a virus, then perhaps an antiviral, although those come with a plethora of side effects that we would not want to do unless it was absolutely necessary.